so thanks for coming out. My name is John Gammon. I'm a platform architect for Pivotal. I cover Sonic. I'm based out of Dallas. Alan Plummer, uh, IT director of platform engineering. I've uh, been with Sonic for a couple of years now. All right, thanks for coming out for the last session. So, um, so Sonic started their digital transformation journey back in 2013. They um, saw an opportunity with the rise of mobile and apps to take advantage of some of their unique capabilities, which we'll talk about what those are. Um, they started a very ambitious project to really transform the technology, also the culture, and build a, a major app for uh, order ahead. So, so well, let me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a quick, we'll do a quick Sonic overview, which Alan will do, and then I'm going to do an app overview. I'm going to talk about the app. I'm going to show some screenshots and what they built and talk about the architecture and go into the, um, some of the outcomes that they've seen. And then Alan's going to go into more of the meat of the presentation, which is the, the cultural changes that they made along with some of the innovations that they built onto the platform. So you know, I'll hand it over to you now. Yeah, I was just so eager to, to talk yeah. about it. So sorry about that. Um, Sonic Drive-In, this is the Bricktown location in Oklahoma City. This is our headquarters. Uh, has several hundred corporate employees there. We've been around um, since the 50s as a drive-in uh, restaurant. We also have drive-throughs and, and some of our restaurants um, in certain locations are, are kind of dine-in only. Um, we've got um, a pretty good footprint across the U.S. We've got 46 states thereabout. Uh, there's always kind of in flux there, whether that's Rhode Island or, you know, Vermont or New Hampshire. I can't remember which of the states that we're not in. Uh, Hawaii is one that we're not in because I'll uh, put my name in the hat for going there. Um, but we focus on customer experience. Um, that, that was a key initiative for, um, uh, from the founder, Troy Brown and uh, also has been taken forward um, um, through the years, through the generations that, that have been there. So last year, last fall, we were um, purchased by Inspire Brands. Inspire Brands owns Arby's and Buffalo Wild Wings, and they recently announced the uh, purchase last week of uh, Jimmy John's. So uh, with the purchase of Jimmy John's and Sonic, uh, uh, Inspire Brands is now, uh, I think it's positioned as the number four largest uh, restaurant group in the U.S. And some quick facts about what we do and what we sell, just from a scale or volume perspective, if you put some conies um, end to end around the, it would fit around the US uh, as far as the volume that we sell in one year. And the mints that we give away and every order that you get, you get free mints. Um, if you stack them up and down, uh, you would do that 5,000 times on the Empire State Building. So some interesting facts there. There's some other, um, pretty interesting things as far as scale that we, we have. Anybody remember these guys? These guys are popular. Uh, they've been with us for well over a decade. They're two Broadway actors and do, have done a fabulous job to promote the Sonic brand. Um, and we, we put a significant amount of dollars um, into marketing. And so with all of the money that goes into marketing, it's been, as John alluded to earlier, um, it's been only recently that we actually started putting a, a major investment in technology to undergird uh, that marketing. As you can imagine, digital marketing is starting to take on uh, a good bit of the budgetary line items for that. And then having the technology with Pivotal and partnership with Pivotal, being able to actually put that forward at scale to our customers to deliver on what we promise in our marketing has been very important for us. Um, this is kind of a eye candy, but it gives you an idea if you're not familiar with Sonic. It, it shows a typical layout of a store with an awful lot of um, interesting cars that I wish I had. Um, but at any rate, you see that it's a drive-in model. And so if you're a computer guy, you think sequential versus parallel, this is a parallel model. So, um, you know, theoretically you can process things a bit more faster. So um, it's very interesting when you think about this versus a drive-through model or a counter pickup model. Um, our previous CEO um, who started the investment, the major investment in the order head experience with the mobile app and the platform in particular, um, he made the comment that really resonated with me that I heard when I first started. He said, if you, if you're to take um, a mobile order head experience, a, uh, a premier digital um, consumer experience with a customer and build a restaurant around it, um, what would you build? Especially in a quick service restaurant industry. 
Um, and he said, you'd build a sonic drive-in is what you'd build. So um, we feel that we're uniquely positioned uh, in the marketplace. Uh, we, we admire our competitors. We admire uh, folks like Chick-fil-A who do it right. Um, we, we admire the mobile app experience with Starbucks, Panera Bread. Um, these, are, these are folks that we admire, quite frankly, and we look at that and we think to ourselves, what can we do to, um, to also leverage technology and um, be like them in some ways and do things better than them in some ways, especially from an operational perspective? Um, and so when you think about that, um, going into a drive through with an order head experience at a quick service restaurant, you're still in a line you still get in a, a, a queue of some sort to actually go and get your food. Um, you think of another experience where you might have a counter pickup of an order ahead. You still have to get out of your car and go inside and actually get, uh, get your food. At a Sonic, however, you don't have to talk to anybody. Um, you don't have to get out of your car. Um, as an introvert like me, that's, that's like super important, right? So uh, being able to actually um, get my order right each time and know that it's going to come out fresh and hot and the way I like it, um, that's important to me. So, so there's a lot of technology at the store that was significantly challenging for us to be able to, you could do as, as nice cloud architecture and platform uh, as you like, but you're still dealing with monolith applications in the store. It's hard to change, hard to change at scale, uh, et cetera. So I'm going to pass it to John. He's going to kind of right. walk through the app overview. Yeah, so I took it as kind of as a user of the app. I wanted to show what it looked like before we dive into some of the stuff they've done. Um, the app is on the Apple Store and on the Android Store, and it's very highly rated. It's 4.8 stars out of 5 and with 342,000 ratings, and it's consistently in the top 10. So right now, when I took the screenshot, it was number 11. Um, so when you go into the app, you have at the top where they can market to their customers. So you, they, these will swipe by with, um, with certain promotions, and then you can see where I can place, replace an order. And then down in the bottom, you can see where I've got my picture. So it's got the personalized experience. And then once I go to my shopping cart, you can see I've added a, a free corn dog from one of the promotions. It's got my um, location where it remembers where I ordered last time, and then I can place my order. Then I drive in, park at the stall. And once I'm there, I pull the app back up. I can check in. And the stall has a number. I put in my number. And then on the at each of these stalls, there is what they call a pop screen that will show the status. So it has my picture again. It says John in the bottom left of the LCD. And then it says order placed, paid, and then processing. And then eventually they'll bring it out. It'll show the name of the person that brings it out. And they'll say, hey, John, here's your order. So very personalized. Now, from an architecture perspective, you have above store, which is everything running on AWS and the app that I'm running on my phone. And then in each of the 3,600 stores, there is a POS that is the source of truth for all the pricing. And the pricing is not the same across every Sonic. So they will go, when, once somebody picks one of the Sonics, then they'll do the pricing. Uh, the DDI is a, think of it like a workstation running uh, Windows and a C++ application that's processing the orders. And then each of the pop stalls, there's 85,000 stalls, um, has that LCD screen. Now, when the order comes in from the iPhone or Android, it's placed on a RabbitMQ queue, which gets sent to the store. Each store has a queue. And then the store will send back to the DAPI, with the DAPI, which is running uh, on Pivotal. That's what's running on, on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And it will send back status of the order, where it is in the process, things like that. Anything you want to add on that slide? I just would like to say uh, it's, a, it's a pretty significant undertaking with the technology um, uh, at the store. Um, there, as, as John mentioned, there are 85,000 stalls, 3,600 stores. About 3,400 of those are order ahead enabled. Um, but there is a various uh, permutations of, of, uh, of different POSs that are at the store. Uh, two main POSs, but different versions of those. And so there's different ways that kind of glueware that we have to kind of do some integration work 
um, at the store level to actually make this stuff happen. As John alluded to earlier, the, the sor source of truth for pricing is at the store. So because it's a 95% franchisee-owned place, um, uh, the franchisees can actually set their prices the way they like. So as you're using the mobile app, um, every time you go to the cart and get your, uh, the pricing for the corn dog or, or combo meal or whatever, um, it's actually going down to the, stall, uh, the store, the back end POS for that particular store and bringing that back up through the cloud, through Cloud Foundry and back into your mobile app. So there's a lot of um, opportunity for things to go wrong. So, uh, so it's very interesting to, to note that like John's um, um, user journey as far as check-in as, as he was talking about, having that check-in experience where he hits the check mark for stall number 11, let's say, um, when he looks over there and sees his face at the pop stall, um, that is measured. We, we measure that as a KPI and uh, generally speaking, the median uh, time is 0.44 seconds. So um, it's kind of amazing how much uh, round trip things have to go. So Yeah, and it's 0.4 and then you said for placing the order is one second and, yeah. and payment is three seconds. Yeah, it's so a little over three yeah. seconds for the payment part. So uh, anyway. And there right. was a lot of work that went around uh, actually remediating some, um, some performance issues with that. Okay, and then some of the outcomes they've seen, just to hit on this, they um, have, it's been way ahead of schedule. So um, they hit their brand wide target six months early and you can see at the bottom uh, for, fi for uh, 2019, they were projecting 7.6 million. Now they're already at 8.5 million active users. So it's been a very successful application. Um, and what they're seeing is, um, and, I, and I talked about the fact that it's in the top 10 of the, the app store, but what they're seeing is the customer loyalty go up. So they have a lot of repeat customers. The number of what they po call power customers has more than doubled. They're spending you know, more uh, over a period of time, 65%. And um, they're seeing that power customer make up 43% of the order ahead sales. All right, so I'll hand it back to Alan. Sure. So platform thinking, uh, this is kind of where um, I want to kind of anchor the rest of the presentation. But uh, this, this right here, I'm not going to read this, but this was an elevator pitch that we started uh, back in 2016 to uh, kind of revamp our version one mobile app. Our version one mobile app uh, was a white label app. We went out to market and we found somebody that actually did these kinds of things and just skinned it for us. And uh, it, it was not something that we're proud of, nor could we maintain. So it's one of those things that's like, okay, let's learn from our mistakes and move on and start going into um, platform thinking. Let's build a platform that can actually facilitate a business outcome, um, multiple business outcomes from multiple channels. The thing I wanna uh, highlight is this, unlike our channel specific approach, this is an opportunity for us to kind of realize some mistakes and be able to actually make things right on this. So, so this was kind of set up as the North Star for our digital innovation platform. We call it the DIP, so you might hear us talk about that uh, during this talk. Um, this slide is something that uh, my platform engineering team uh, really focuses on, and this is one of the first slides that I show anybody who I'm trying to familiarize with my team or my, um, our team's capabilities, what the platform can do. Um, and to organize or orient yourselves to the slide, start at the bottom right, the principles. Um, and if you kind of scan through here, you'll see that there's nothing Sonic specific in this. There's nothing QSR specific in this. There's nothing um, really on the, especially the right hand side, there's nothing around money in this, like, you know, minimize your cost or whatever. There is some goals over here uh, related to reduction of TCO. But if you start down here at the bottom right and, and start executing against principles of the platform, automation first, when we evaluate new technology, is it something that we can actually automate? Is it something that, you know, so these are levers that are used with its stacked ranked number one. Uh, if we can't automate it, I heard it in a previous talk and I love it. He said, um, let's see, no dewey in the gooey, right? So um, I'm going to steal that because that's like awesome. That's what the motto he uses for his platform engineering team. Um, the third one, I'm going to skip to the third one, prioritize discovery and recovery over eliminating downtime. This is an interesting one, and I think most technologists understand the principle here, um, but a lot of business folks don't. Um, so it's a constant education to, um, to say, yes, we care about eliminating downtime. We, we absolutely do. Our, we're not taking our eye off the ball on that. 
But the thing is, when we start doing incident response and things like that, we, our job doesn't end when an RCA is done. What we need to do is learn from that and actually build some chaos engineering or some synthetic testing or something around that alerting maybe that we didn't, needed to know about. So what we're doing is prioritizing the learning aspect, learning from downtime rather than eliminating downtime. Uh, one of the things that I, when I first started at Sonic, um, I started setting my team's goals, and one of the goals was to um, um, promote platform availability. And the metric on that goal was to reduce downtime. And I realized myself, after a year of that, I was like, no, that, that, that can't be the metric. What we need to do is learn from that and actually start implementing some practices that would give us the outcome of um, eliminating downtime or making platform more available. More available. Um, and then these other things, these goals are the goals of the platform that um, having that flexibility for experimentation, et cetera. So this is, this is a slide that I wanted to put out in front of Pivotal customers, in front of people who are uh, familiar with the CF push um, uh, kind of story, user story for developers. Uh, Sonic, however, has has chosen strategically, I'm not saying this is right or wrong or making a judgment call on it, but we chose strategically early on to insert um, um, basically some tooling in between the developer experience and Cloud Foundry. So uh, the thing that does the CF push is actually our DIP CLI that we wrote. So when, our, when, our, when we're on board a brand new developer, that developer really doesn't know anything about Cloud Foundry, nor do they know anything about the infrastructure it's being deployed on. All they do is they pull down our tooling for our, for our CLI, they do a dip in it, and when they do a dip in it, a Spring Boot app, a uh, boilerplate comes up and is built for them. And they have a couple little tweaks in a YAML file, um, in two different YAML files that, number one, describes their project, but in, the, in our pipeline system, they also describe their environments that they want to target. So it's five, four or five lines in the YAML file. Um, and when they do a git push after they commit, um, that's when we take that over and our automation builds their pipelining for them. So we don't have any DevOps engineers that hand roll um, pipelines. So our tooling, our DIP CLI, our Dev CICD systems that we have actually build that tooling, or excuse me, build that pipeline uh, from Dev all the way to Prod for them. So after a few minutes time, they can go to our, uh, our delivery infrastructure, um, our DI team's um, uh, Go CD instance and see the pipeline that, that was uh, automatically built for them. And when they press the, the play button for actually, it'll actually commit and do the CF push for them in the lower environments, but they're actually able to see the history of that every time they commit. Um, it's actually being deployed, doing the CF push under the hood. So I wanted to lay that in there because our platform engin engineering team is a little bit different than what most people here are from a development team mindset. Um, so most development teams do the CF push that are Pivotal customers. Um, we decided to insert that layer there. And uh, as far as innovations, I'm going to anchor on these last three, um, these last three things here: business focus KPIs, synthetic testing, and chaos engineering. Um, business fo focus KPIs. This is important to us because um, um, variety of reasons. Most the the biggest one is that whenever you do an upgrade, you want to be able to actually know that things are done uh, well. You want to be able to actually measure true user experience rather than the technical metrics alone. When you deploy things, you want to make sure that that doesn't alter the median time for check-in, for example. Um, and so it's understandable when I talk about a median time for check-in. Uh, our VPs on the business side know exactly what we're talking about. So do our technologists. So. Um, but these things should be alertable, trendable over time, and relatively static, meaning let's not change those KPIs around. Um, and these things show broad system-wide health across um, the entire holistic platform. Um, a little side story on this. Uh, when we started rolling out Order Ahead last year, uh, you see the timing down there. If you can't, it's 2018, so it starts in June and it goes through July. We started seeing that the bottom line is, your, uh, is our median check-in time, the top line is our median pricing time, and the midline there is, was our median um, pricing time, and the top one was payment time, excuse me. Um, and so you see that rise on the orange, but the other two are flat. And so it was only by like tracking this over time that we actually saw an issue. 
as we started going out to scale and we started actually getting more and more transactional data for pricing specifically. And so an APM solution is great. It shows you a deviation over baseline and that's an awesome thing, but it's a very targeted thing. Um, so understanding from a business KPI perspective and tracking it over time allowed us to see that knowing that we would hit a brick wall at some point and have downtime. Um, we didn't have downtime. What we did was we put a team together and we tackled the problem, realized it was actually a, a table that needed a certain index. We applied that index in the database and the next day everything is, is hunky-dory. In fact, it, it trended everything else down since that was a user journey that affected everything else. So anyway, that's an example of, of leveraging those business KPIs actually to detect things in your, in your system. So this is an interesting uh, kind of snapshot out of our Slack instance. You may not be able to read it, but this, there were zero approved payments in the last two minutes, and then I followed it immediately by there were zero confirmed visits. Remember the, the visits, or the check-in, that's a visit. So the check-in is a, is a business KPI. The payment is a business KPI. So alerting on that and getting that in front of the engineers as soon as that happens uh, was critical. And so we, uh, we start actually uh, running an incident after this. Didn't know if it was logging or, or if it actually was a legitimate thing. This, this is a, another view uh, of a Splunk dashboard around our business KPIs. Um, you see check-in, uh, medium price quote time, uh, payment time, etc. And this is an interesting board and we have it on a television um, and that television actually is, is in a uh, common area and uh, we have a, a president of our brand president Claudia she comes down and, and looks at that and she makes comments about it and she actually you know likes to see that um, there's another part of the board that talk about dollars and how much you know per minute is going through and things like that And the bottom right I put there um, to, to share because uh, sometimes when we do a corn dog special or you know 50 cent corn dog you see people like, no judgment here, but you see that's like the number one item like at breakfast time. Um, and so again, no judgment, but you, you, see, you see that happen and it's pretty interesting to watch that data. So once we kind of started maturing the business KPIs, we started trying to figure out ways of doing synthetic testing. And um, there's a lot of definitions for synthetic testing and I'm not gonna say which one is right or wrong or whatever, but I wanted to kind of share what it means for Sonic when we say synthetic testing. It basically is a monitoring of our infrastructure and apps by simulating a real user journey flow. And generally it's a happy path. So we have programmatic um, execution of pricing a medium cherry limeade, for example. So every store has a medium cherry limeade. It may be a different price, but that's a flagship product. It's in every POS system. It's in every permutation of store. So we price a medium cherry limeade over all of our order ahead enabled stores, which is roughly 3,400 multiple times an hour. And we actually track that 24 hours uh, a day. And the why here, which is interesting, is that we have, um, we have had a change control policy that is um, pretty risk averse for change. And so we wind up doing upgrades in many ways at night, especially our infrastructure. And there's nobody going to a Sonic at night, it's shut down. There's no car hops, there's no operations team. So how do you actually see data in the, in the system? Uh, well, you don't unless you actually do synthetic testing. And so we actually use this as a canary for us to understand if our upgrades are successful. Uh, we actually look at the metrics of that, um, you know, the timing of that, et cetera. And, um, and it is a canary for us uh, in production and um, also during an upgrade. So. This is, a, this is a screenshot, again in Splunk, about our, uh, with our synthetic pricing uh, testing. And so the important thing to point out here is the top right, that 2.11%. That 2.11% is, is good, all right? So uh, we have a static failure rate, kind of the signal noise ratio of, of roughly 2 to 3%, uh, depending on you know, network outages, things like that. Um, you know, you can imagine um, you know, somewhere in the middle of a cornfield, your, you know, your internet service is probably not optimal. Um, so things happen that way. So um, when this thing starts to rise, we start getting alerting around 5%. Uh, 
Um, and so when we get alerted around that, we know that there's something holistically, or across the holistic system, there is something in there that's wrong. Um, and so it helps us to identify that. You see the unstable store pricing at seven, um, failed pricing at 71 on the current run. What that basically means is when we fail for some reason, we Im immediately attempt it again. And some of the monolith code base that's in the store, um, there's, there's some state machine logic in there. I don't want to bore you with details, but um, sometimes things get out of whack. And so a good thump on the ear and just doing it immediately after actually fixes the thing. We call that an unstable pricing uh, for a store. So we can actually drive in into that and actually see what those stores are that are um, kind of having that uh, successful but being the second run. So it's pretty interesting. And so you can see that over time as well. All right. So last thing I want to talk about uh, is chaos engineering. So um, when I was introduced to this concept, first of all, do y'all recognize these guys? Anybody old like me? I, I loved 80s wrestling. When I, you know, when I was a kid, I loved 80s wrestling. Mid-South wrestling, I was from Louisiana. So Junkyard Dog, man, Queen would start playing. Another one bites the dust, and, and he would come in there with a big chain. and. Um, and then Jake the Snake, of course, you had Hacksaw Jim Duggan and, and Andre the Giant here. Um, we started actually kind of codifying a lore, a, a, um, a wrestling lore around chaos engineering. Um, so we actually have fun with it. We have a, one of our engineers built a, a promoter API, and this promoter API is written in Golang and, and in Cloud Foundry. Um, and it's running, and you actually can send a JSON payload to it. Um, that describes, um, like, I have a Kerry Von Erich Iron Claw, and the Iron Claw is, is a move that is actually done against an RDS database by pressure testing that RDS database. I create an empty table with no index and then insert a bunch of records and then throw another thread on and try to actually select off that record, off that table, uh, do a delete, do some select start, basically do everything that's bad in, in, in you know, DBA land, and it, and it pushes that CPU for that RDS up. And so that's the iron claw, close line, the atomic elbow drop. Um, we actually have that running in production. Uh, so we knock over one of our rabbit nodes once, uh, one of our rabbit nodes uh, twice a day in production. And so the key takeaway from here is that you can look at tools like Turbulence and Chaos Monkey and Lemur, um, but quite frankly, that's written by a bash script running on a concourse pipeline. I mean, the principles are the same though. Think through, we had to think through how we wanted to uh, actually pressure test the system. So. Not expecting you to read this except for left side, we all know what chaos engineering is. We like it, we understand it. Right side, we need to kind of inform our business stakeholders that they don't like things like terminating, knocking down, chaos. You know, these are words that are not super um, helpful. So what we are doing though, and truthfully, is we're doing resiliency testing. That's what we're doing. So. Um, so anyway, there's, there's, we package the message two different ways. Internally, we, we have lore and, and talk about the legends of Junkyard Dog and, you know, do all these things. And on the right-hand side, when we go to change control, we talk about resiliency testing and what we're doing and improving that. So anyway, uh, culture shift, and this is the last slide. We're at time, but basically on the left side, this is saying things in our Slack. Um, in prod, Junkyard Dog is entering the ring against Redis with the sound of Queens. Another one bites the dust. Uh, on the right-hand side, one of our engineers, he, uh, he took the training wheels off of Andre the Giant and Jake the Snake, so no more dry run and non-prod. So, so we're actually doing some things and um, trying to knock some things over and make things better. So with that, I think we're at time. Does anybody have questions for John or I? Yep. All right. Thanks for coming. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, it, it was no. It was it was um, it was an abstraction, a purposeful abstraction of the CF command line, and what that DIP CLI also does. Uh, we have CI/CD for our Splunk uh, dashboards and alerting, for example. Um, that DIP CLI is also doing all of the uh, REST calls into Splunk Cloud, 
And it, so it's executable by our GoCD pipeline. So anytime someone commits uh, a Splunk dashboard and a repo, um, GoCD picks that up. It executes certain command line switches on the DIP CLI, which then actually push out. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a tooling for us, unique to us on that. So anyway, yes, sir. Uh, and one minute. So yeah. So the the franchisees you talk about for for this stuff or yeah and also I'm wondering what do they complain about the most? Uh, that's very good. Um, so we don't give them any UI. That's one. That's probably an oversight, but that might be something that we could actually develop. Um, this is the, the statistics on the these um, the platform engineering and um, uh, the development activities are actually presented to a, a franchise franchisee advisory council uh, on a regular basis. And so, um, so the stats are there and presented in that format. I don't know if there's been an interest in actually. So if they want to set their own price for cherry lime. Oh, that's a, got it, got it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So there's a sonicmenus.com uh, portal that they go in and actually do that. So that's outside of the platform. And so that's a kind of an operational um, uh, operational app that they use for that. So, yeah, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yes, sir. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk briefly uh, the size of your team that maintains So, I've got uh, uh, five uh, FTEs reporting to me, and um, I've got seven uh, contractors. So, 12. And then how much for the pivotal piece exactly, the, the pivotal platform? From an operations perspective, yeah. I've got five. You yeah, five? Okay. Yep. Yep. So they provide 24-7 support. It's an offshore, onshore model. So. All right, any more questions? Yep. Uh, I guess I was just wondering sure. if that, uh, the number of operators decreased. What's that now? I was wondering if the number of operators if, if they decrease over time? No, we've kept them about the same. You started with five? Uh, actually, we started with uh, uh, two or three, and then we changed out operators and went to a five model so we can actually cover the overnight hours as well. So when we do upgrades and things like that, a lot of our offshore team actually does that work in the overnight hours for us. So 